you mentioned Nicaragua, mm. um, and um, one of my favorite books that you've written is uh, The Jaguar Smile, which is uh, about a comes out of a three-week journey to Nicaragua mm. during uh, the time of the Sandinistas. Um, um, talk about the process of writing reportage. I, uh, it's your only full-length non-fiction mm. book. You've written other books of essays, but um, was did it feel very different from yeah. writing fiction? Yeah, completely different. I mean, well, I went, actually, I was in the middle of writing the Satanic Verses, and, and the book wasn't going, I mean, I was sort of stuck. You know, and, and then at, the say, at that moment, coincidentally, I was invited to go uh, to Nicaragua, and I just thought, you know, maybe it'll be good for me just to get out of my own head and go and look at some people with real problems. You know, and, and, and so I put it aside and went there, and it had an enormous impact on me being there. You know, and, and, um, and when I came back, I couldn't get it out of my head, and the, the only way of getting it out of my head was to write, and, and so it became this short reportage book. Um, no, it's very different because, um, well, you have to have a standard of proof for a start. You know, I used to worry about, when I read some of uh, V.S. Naipaul's uh, reportage travel mm -hmm. books, uh, I would worry about evidence. You know, I, I mean, for instance, there's in his book, Among the Believers, he has long interviews with um, senior ayatollahs in Tehran. Mm -hmm including some of the worst people in the world, Ayatollah Khalkhali, for example, the kind of hanging judge. Um, and there, these interviews are you know, like 20 pages um, of direct speech, directly yes. quoted speech. Um, and then Naipaul said in interviews that he had not used a tape recorder and he didn't know shorthand. But he had to have a prodigious memory. Well, that's what he said. He said he just remembered it, you know. And I thought, you know, if I'm reading an interview with Ayatollah Khalkhali, I would like to be certain that the words being put in his mouth really came out of his mouth. And so then the question of if there's no evidence, you know, there's no, no, there's no note taking and there's no tape recorder, what kind of status does that text have? You know, um, and I worried about that, therefore, when I was uh, in Nicaragua, and I could see his point, because, for instance, there was an evening when I was invited to dinner at the president's house. So I was at Daniel Ortega's house, and most, mo not all, but most of the Sandinista leadership sitting around the table, about 20 or 30 people, you know, and me. And I thought, you know, if I put a tape recorder on the table, it changes the conversation. The, the way they're going to talk is going to be completely different if they see the machine. And clearly, I can't be scribbling because I've been invited to dinner. You know, and looks, looks wrong. So, on the other hand, I thought, I've got to have the same reason because of remembering this right. Naipaul thing. I've got to have some kind of a record. So, how, what do I do? So, I invented a violent stomach upset. <laughs> and what I would do is every five or six minutes, excuse myself and go to the bathroom. <laughs> and, and when I was in the bathroom, I'd write to <laughs> And then go out there and say, very sorry. <laughs> I'd have a little more to eat and then dive for the bathroom again. Um, but at least it meant that I came out with a great sheet of, a sheaf of scribbled notes, which was useful. And, and again, there was a moment when I had an interview with Violeta Chamorro, who was at that point a newspaper proprietor and subsequently became president uh, of, of Nicaragua. And then and her son uh, uh, led the opposition. Yeah, well, the family is, it's one of those families just split right down the middle. Half the family is right wing and the other half family is left wing. Yes. And they have a Sunday lunch where they all get together and they're not allowed to talk about politics. <laughs> um, and she was, I thought, very slippery. And I did use a tape recorder with, with her. And she was the only person who I actually caught in a number of lies. Um, and, and I was very happy afterwards to have her, have her answers on tape. You know, because if you're going to accuse a very senior public figure of lying, you better be able to play the tape you know, um, if, if she comes back at you. So, so that's one huge difference. It's just a question of evidence. And how is the process of writing nonfiction? Did it feel constraining or limiting to... No, um, no it's stick faster. To reality. In many ways, it's faster. 
you know. I mean, but it's similar rules apply. I mean, if you want the book to be, I mean, you know, you know this. You're writing, you're writing about these gangsters and, and and dance girls. For the book to be interesting to the reader, they have to emerge as characters. Yes. You know, so so you have to in fact use uh, a novelistic skill. Uh, to portray them as people that can be understood or you know, responded to by the reader <laughs> as real people. Um, so in that sense, you know, you're writing the same way, you know, except that the people actually exist. Um, or in your case, I mean, did they actually exist or did you... I made them all up. No, no, no. I mean, what I mean is, did you combine them? <laughs> no, I, I found it, um, as I was writing the book, I'd meet all these characters and then... Uh, I, I would take notes. I too would take frequent bathroom breaks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I need a good bathroom. Exactly. <laughs> and in India, it's very easy to have stomach upsets. <laughs> uh, so then I came back to Brooklyn with this enormous uh, mass of material. And uh, often there would be gaps in the narrative. That is, I'd have uh, two scenes in the life of a character. And I realized that. Uh, I'd forgotten to ask the character about the intervening uh, scene. So mm. I didn't have a complete narrative. And I couldn't go back to that person because they might be in jail or dead or mm. uh, otherwise untraceable. And then it would be really easy for me to make uh, up yeah. the intervening yeah. scene. Yeah. I could do it just once. But then I realized that if I did it just once, then I could do it over and over again. And then what would prevent me from just calling the whole thing mm. a novel. Mm. Um, so I decided to stick with what I had mm -hmm. and if I didn't have the complete um, life of the character or the, or the scene then I just yeah. left it incomplete because life's like that, yeah. it's incomplete. Yeah. Um, I thought the same thing, I mean, with, with the, I mean, you know, if you're in, in a country for a relatively short space of time, the amount that you can know is 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 finite. You 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 cannot know everything in the way that you would know if you spent years and years there. You know? So so in the end, then you have to just accept that and foreground it. You have to say that what you're writing is partial and and uh, not uh, encyclopedic. You know, and that there are gaps in it, and there will be. So you're writing a series of. The image I use is it's like a series of snapshots. Yes. You know, like there's this moment here, there's a moment here, there's a moment here. It's not like the full portrait. Like, I think you have to acknowledge it. You know, and that's another difference with fiction, um, where you obviously don't need to make those acknowledgments, and you can fill in the gaps. Yes. But you're writing your um, memoir right now, or, or, or yeah. part of your memoir, um, and. Well, that's non-fiction. That is non-fiction. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, I mean, look. First of all, it never occurred to me when I was when I was wanting to be a writer, and indeed when I became a writer, it never occurred to me that I would write an autobiography. It just seemed like the least interesting thing to do. Uh, it had nothing to do with why I became a writer. You know? um, and then I acquired an interesting life. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> which m most writers, frankly, don't have. <laughs> um, Some have more interesting lives than others. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is up there. <laughs> so, and and so I find, after all these years, that I that you know there is a story to tell, and I'm trying to tell it. Um, it's very strange. It's very strange to, to do it because I'm writing a, about a lot of people, m most of whom are still alive. Uh, not all, and um, not all of whom behaved well. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, it's the, the, the pleasurable thing is to write about the people who did behave well. Mm -hmm. so, uh, it, um, and in fact, the difficult thing is to write about the other stuff because I, I sort of one of the things I know is that I don't want to write this book as a kind of way of getting even, mm -hmm. you know, or settling scores, because mm -hmm. uh, I think that's small-minded, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but there are there are parts of the story which wouldn't make sense except in in the context of people not being their best selves, you know, and and, and um, so it has to be told. It's difficult. Uh, how much of the book of the memoir is um, set in Bombay and, uh, uh, and is about your childhood? Well, but yeah, I mean, I don't know because I haven't written it yet, you know. Um, <laughs> well, I've written some of it, but it it's not chronological. So you yeah, no, but I mean, I would say. 
Well, I've written about 100 pages, and most of them are about backstory. Um, so I, 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 I assume the book will be around 400, but I'm not sure. You know? I mean, I don't know. Um, and it's a first draft, so it could get longer or shorter. Or, I mean, you know, ask me again in a couple of years. And uh, you, you know, you've done this. So your writing is where you write all this stuff. Yes. You know, from all over the place, and uh, and what gets into the book and it gets worried is is, uh, is another question. You know. Yeah. Then then there's then you have the whole book and it's uh, assembled, and then there's the hideous trench warfare of line editing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Getting this thing. And of course, in nonfiction, that's harder because there's because the truth issue is there which means which means you know you obviously if possible want to not be sued for libel um, and so that that becomes and the more contentious the material the more likely it is that somebody will try and sue you if you just step over a line you know? and of course again in America it's harder to do that um, but you're familiar with the phenomenon of libel tourism you know, which is where people go and sue in England because you can definitely sue there and right. get lots of money. Um, although there are attempts now in the English courts to limit, to limit that in, in order to prevent this phenomenon no, from taking place.